physics. All right, today what we want to do is take a look at collisions and get an understanding for exactly what's happening when two things collide. Now we're going to take a look at just a, a ball running into a cube, uh, but this could be any two things that collide with one another. Now there's lots of different types of collisions that occur, and we'll get into those later, uh, but what I want to do is talk today about just collisions in general and things that are true for all collisions anytime two things run into each other. Now, in order to understand collisions, first we need to talk about momentum. Now, we know momentum, P, is equal to mass times velocity, or that's how it's described. Uh, and this is actually central to our understanding of collisions and in calculating the outcome in any particular collision. So to understand exactly how momentum applies to collisions, what we need to do is actually go back and talk about Newton's second law. Now, Newton's second law, we've all seen before, as force is equal to mass times acceleration, or really net force is equal to mass times acceleration. But the reality here is Newton didn't write the second law this way. He actually wrote it a little bit different. What Newton said was the force on an object is responsible for creating a change in momentum over a change in time. This is actually how he went through it and wrote his law, or what came to be known as his second law. Uh, we've simply taken his law and sort of boiled it down over the years into something that's a little bit easier for, for things like or people like high school students to understand, F equals MA. That's not really what he wrote. But I'll show you how this relates back to the second law. Look at what's going on with momentum. We know momentum is mass times velocity, and we're ha we have force equals change in momentum over change in time. Well, if I expand this numerator out, I'm gonna have a change in mass times velocity over a change in time. And while this seems to have gotten more confusing, let's go one more step with this. I wanna take the M out of this, because when this collision occurs, the mass isn't gonna change. So let's say we're gonna have mass times a change in velocity, over a change in time. And now I want you to realize what we're looking at. We have mass times change in velocity over change in time. Well, change in velocity over change in time is acceleration. And so you can see here, momentum and force and Newton's second law are rather tightly tied together. They're really talking about the same thing, uh, just, just looking at it from different angles. So the question remains, how does this all tie into this collision which is going to occur? And in order to understand this, let's actually let this ball smash into this cube right here. All right, when this ball is moving along, it smashes into this cube, and what we get is a collision. And so what you see here is when this ball smashes into the cube, because the ball can't just pass through the cube like a ghost, there's a normal force between these two objects. That is to say, the ball is pushing on the cube, and therefore the cube is pushing on the ball. Now I'll explain this a little bit more. I think it's clear that when the ball is moving along and it hits the cube, it's going to try to push the cube forward. And if we look at that in terms of Newton's laws, because the ball is pushing on the cube, and because there's a normal force between them, there will be a force forward on the cube by the ball. I'll just show this as a force forward, okay? So this force is acting forward on the cube itself. Now, in order to understand collisions, we need to not look just at Newton's second law and looking at F equals MA, this force F is gonna cause this cube to accelerate at some rate A. We also need to look at Newton's third law. Newton's third law says for every action force, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. And what that means is, in this case, if the ball is pushing forward on the cube with some force F, then the cube must be pushing backwards on the ball with a force that is equal in magnitude. To understand how Newton's third law, combined with our understanding of momentum, can allow us to, to draw great conclusions or to understand collisions, what I want to do is look at impulse. Now you remember impulse, J, 
is equal to a change in momentum. And that can be calculated as a force multiplied by a time. Now this is based on an average force. If we get into forces as functions of time, things become more complicated and start involving calculus. I don't wanna play that game today. So what I wanna do is I wanna look at impulse as it relates to this collision. Right at this instant, when the ball is pushing forward on the block, as this cube is speeding up forward, and at that same instant, as the cube is pushing backwards on the ball, causing the ball to slow down. That's all according to Newton's second law. So in that moment, there's some impulse on this cube. And the impulse on the cube can be given by this force F, whatever that force may be, multiplied by the time that it takes this collision to occur. Now, how long this collision occurs or takes to occur, that's specific to the situation. I want to keep this very general, so I'm not putting numbers to this. I want you to realize, though, there's some impulse on this cube that is going to cause the cube to speed up. Well, much in the same way, because of Newton's third law, there's going to be an impulse on the ball. And that impulse on the ball is going to have a magnitude that is equal to F, that is the force by the cube on the ball, multiplied by however long this collision it takes to occur. Now the time has to be the same between these two objects because we can't have the ball pushing on the cube for a greater amount of time than the cube is pushing back on the ball. The time has to be the same between these two. That's just logic. And according to Newton's third law, the force has to be the same between these two, but in opposite directions. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say the impulse on the ball is backwards or in the negative direction. And that's just assuming to the right is positive. So what we have here is a positive impulse on the cube and a negative impulse on the ball. So now let's go full circle with this idea of impulse and let's tie this back to momentum. And what I want to do is look at the total momentum of our system here. The system being the ball and the cube from before the collision to after the collision. Now we know the total momentum of the system is always going to be the momentum of the ball plus the momentum of the cube. And this is true at any point in time, either before the collision or after the collision. So let's look at this situation and apply it to this equation here. We know our total momentum before the collision is going to be the momentum of the ball plus the momentum of the cube. So before the collision, we had the ball moving along with some mass m of the ball. And it was moving at some velocity v. It just can be any number you want it to be. I don't care. Then we've got our mass of our cube. And it's, it wasn't moving at all initially. It can be if you want. I'm just keeping it simple here, though. Having this not move initially. Now, this collision occurs, and some momentum is exchanged between these two objects. Okay, we can see there's an impulse on the cube, and a negative impulse on the ball, and these two impulses have to be equal in magnitude. So watch what happens here. After the collision, we're going to have some momentum in the ball. Okay, we know that's the initial momentum of the ball, that's m ball times v, plus the impulse that occurred on the ball. So that's gonna be plus the change in momentum. Remember, impulse is change in momentum. So we're gonna have plus our impulse on the ball that was negative Ft. This term is the final momentum of the ball. Whole bunch of subscripts here. Plus we're gonna have the final momentum of our cube. Now our cube, that one's pretty easy. It started with zero momentum. And then we're going to put some impulse on this cube or change its momentum by a total F T. That is the impulse that occurred on the cube. And what I want you to realize in all of this, when we look at this, we, we had some initial momentum here and some final momentum here. And it looks like things have changed a lot, but they haven't. I'll show you how. If we look at this line right here, the total momentum before the collision, I'll put this out here, is equal to just the mass of the ball times V, clearly. After the collision though, we've got what well, looks like a little bit more complicated situation, mass of the ball times V plus negative FT, the impulse on the ball. Then over here we have plus positive FT, 
Well, ultimately these two just cancel out and we get the mass of the ball times V for the total momentum after the collision. And there's a big, big conclusion to be drawn from this. And that is that in this collision, the initial momentum equals the final momentum. And the fact of the matter is we've kept this collision so general. We haven't talked about whether or not the ball sticks to the cube or whether they bounce off each other. Uh, we've kept this very general. And so what I want you to realize is this conclusion that we've drawn can apply to any and every collision. And so the important takeaway from all of this, the point of this entire video is for you to realize that in any collision, the one thing that is true always is that momentum is conserved. We know momentum is conserved because largely Newton's third law applies here. And so the impulse or the positive impulse on one object is equal to the negative impulse on the other. And therefore the total momentum must be conserved. Now there are several different types of collisions and we'll talk about those later on. For now, we just want to look at collisions in general and realize that the total momentum in any and every collision is conserved. And on that note, that's all for now.